This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon. My name is Nancy Kahalen, and I'm president of Your Better Business Bureau. Welcome to the first in a series of lunchtime webinars that we call our Business Builders Series. Today we welcome Josh Iverson, the president and founder of Iverson Media and Communications. The business was founded in 2007 and became accredited with BBB in 2022. Josh is an accomplished online advertising and new media sales and marketing professional with more than a decade of online media sales experience, which makes him super qualified uh, to present on today's topic, how to create a marketing budget and track your marketing success. And before I turn it over to Josh, I just want to take care of a little bit of housekeeping. Today's session uh, will be recorded, you heard that, and all attendees uh, are on mute. If you have a question, Josh will be happy to answer them on the fly, or we can save them to the end. There'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. Just use your little hand for putting your hand up or put something in the chat. That probably would be a great thing to do too. I'll monitor that for Josh. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn it over now to Josh Iverson. Thanks so much, Nancy. Yeah, it's great here to be Great to be here with everyone, and uh, I'm coming to you from Harvard, Massachusetts. So we're on the uh, the uh, eastern edge of of Worcester County, and uh, I hopefully everyone's coming from uh, you know somewhat nearby. But it's it's great to be here and connect with with a lot of businesses. And what we're going to be talking about today is how to create a marketing budget and track your marketing success. I get this question all the time. And I was just having conversations today about it with a bookkeeping firm and another conversation with a, a CPA earlier today. So the, the takeaways are that we're gonna be really covering, um, you know, first and foremost, how to determine how much should go into your marketing budget. This is a common question. Um, how much should I put? We understand that as small businesses, when we're taking money and putting it into our marketing budget, sometimes it's coming, um, you know, directly from our own pocket. Um, the next thing is what to prioritize in your digital marketing budget. Obviously, we don't have um, unlimited budgets. So when you think about what are you going to spend it on first? And then we'll talk about how to track marketing success. And everyone hears ROI, ROI, ROI. Um, but how do you actually think about that? And how do you track that in a way that doesn't take all of your time uh, just to figure it out? And then if we get to it, um, we may not. Uh, we'll talk about what to focus on in each stage of your business. So let's say you're a new business or you're a startup. Let's say you're in the growth phase. Let's say you're established and a market leader. And then let's say you're actually thinking about an exit plan and that may be in your next two or three years. So we'll try and get to how to apply digital marketing and advertising and marketing in general. So first of all, um, there is some source material. Um, this will be included. If this PowerPoint's made available, you can go back and look at it when I'm throwing out some data points um, that I got from these, these areas. Um, a little bit about me and my credentials. Um, I won't go into too many details, but I did do a digital marketing um, degree, um, specifically in advertising um, from Brigham Young University. And then I came out to Boston and did my MBA at strategy at BU. And then I've been an adjunct professor um, in the past, most recently two years at Babson College. And as many of you know, um, they're number one for entrepreneurship. And I was in the technology department. And, you know, Babson actually does a great job for small businesses as well. Um, I think my business education has probably given me most of my chops though, um, which is probably the case for any other small business owner. I, I started my first company in college that was acquired by a company out here in Boston called Y2M. But I've done Super 8 Motel, which was a family business, and that was some of the hardest um, you know, work that I've done. I was able to sell that company though. I've done e-commerce, and most recently, Iverson Media and Communications, and our main brands are iMedia Sales Team, iMedia Audiences, and Reptide Media. Um, you can find us online, iMedia Audiences, Local Digital. I try and practice what I preach. So um, I love that we are um, BBB accredited and um, it's been great because we historically were not as big in small businesses. We were mainly in larger businesses. And, and part of the reason I've become so passionate about small businesses is it has a lot to do with my topic today. 
and I'll get into those stories. You can scan that QR code with your phone and there will be a couple other QR codes throughout this presentation. If you look me up online, you might you might come across this and, and it's um, you might wonder, well, why is he um, why is he even working still? Well, this is a, the the truth is I was one of Facebook's earliest ad sales guys and I didn't join the company. It was kind of crazy back then. Um, technology comes and goes. Facebook's huge. It's a uh, you know 71% of the US is on Facebook, not as big as Google. But um, they're not going to be around forever. Um, it seems like they have been, but they won't be. And, and back then it was new. It was something interesting. And I chose not to move to California. Um, I wasn't given an obvious chance, but I didn't pursue it. I've been happy and, and here in the Boston area for a long time. And it's certainly informed my, my decisions in later years. All right. Well, back to, our, back to our agenda. So let's first talk about how to determine how much should go into your marketing budget. I'm going to share a couple definitions just to think about this because this this does tend to be where you need to start getting organized. Your marketing budget, you should think about that as the big part of the budget. That could be everything. That could be people. And that's all aspects of your sales, marketing, and branding. So maybe you print business cards. That's part of your marketing budget. Maybe you pay an admin a certain number of hours to do marketing. That's part of your marketing budget. Then we talk about your digital marketing budget. That could be your website could be online marketing, online advertising. And then we talk about your advertising budget. And that's when you're actually spending money on something, a print ad, a radio ad, um, Google search ads, where you're putting in a certain amount of money and you expect that to come back and generate clients for you. And that's um, you know, really where you talk about ROI. So we'll talk about the differences between those a little bit. Just as a, an idea, um, this could be an exercise. So at a certain point, you should just think about, well, what are all the things that are in your marketing budget? A lot of people say, I don't spend anything on marketing. But the reality is they do mailers, they do a lot of hand notes, they take out a lot of their own time to do marketing, they might do networking groups. Try and put a number to all of your marketing activity and um, think about what that means. So when we, when we look at the numbers and we actually think about how much you should spend for small business businesses, which are in the 500,000 a year to 5 million a year in sales, and you've got a minimum EBITDA of 12%, these are the numbers. About 8% about of revenue is spent on that marketing budget. If you're a B2B business, um, might be a little lower, meaning you're selling to other businesses, might be only two to 5%. And if you're looking at um, B2C, it's going to be a little bit higher at five to 10%. Now, small businesses spend less than larger businesses. So if you think about some comparisons, and this is in small businesses, this is now the advertising budget. And remember the difference is this is including actual media that they're buying, um, spending it uh, across the board from TV to radio to Google ads, furniture stores at 4.4%, and uh, death care services way down at 1.83%. But this is still considered that. Now, I know I might be boring you with all of these data points. Um, marketing is a much more data-heavy business than you, than you might have thought. A lot of spreadsheets go into it. But let's move on. This is just kind of an example. This is a company um, in Canada. And uh, this is they just had a lot of really great data. So I wanted to talk about this. This comes from the, the equivalent of the, the BBB in Canada. So this is an average investment in websites and online marketing. And a lot of times we think historically those websites took a lot of money, mainly because of the SEO industry, which has been um, supplanted a little bit by Google in most recent days, um, where you just don't need to put as much of that small business budget into SEO. One of the reasons so many companies did put it into SEO was because it was something they could do. And now that the internet audience has grown so much and you've got so many people online in your ne neck of the woods within a local area, um, SEO is not as important because people sometimes find you on other means. Um, it's still important, but it's not necessarily as big of a chunk. But you look at these numbers um, and it can be pretty daunting sometimes to think about, wow, um, that's very expensive. A website at night, almost 20,000 a year, that's pretty expensive. Online marketing, almost 14,000 a year if you're doing less than 2 million in sales. But again, this comes from Canada, so it's Canadian dollars, but still it's equivalent. These are just some numbers to think about. Um, I think the biggest shift is that the websites are much more affordable nowadays. Um, so how much should you spend? Well, if you just think about back of the napkin, 
if you're at a million in annual revenue, it might be 70 to 140K a year for your total marketing budget. You might have staff, you might have systems. Sometimes people get sales confused with marketing. Um, sales is included in marketing in this example. Look at that advertising budget, and it might be 35 to 70K a year if you're at a million in revenue. So if you're a, you know, a landscaping business, for example, um, electrician, plumber, you got a couple trucks, um, you know, you're going to be thinking about, well, maybe a couple thousand a month in Google ads, maybe a couple hundred bucks a month in websites, maybe a social person, the, uh, those numbers add up. So one thing to do is really think about what, what's right for you. And just because this is what the data shows doesn't mean that that's right for you. Um, one thing to think about is because it's so um, per, small business is so personal, right? You think about an owner's draw and how that might factor into everything. Um, for those of you that are small business owners, or maybe those of you that are working for a small business owner, there's a there's an owner's draw. So that's another way to think about it. Um, you know, your marketing budget can be pulled out of that. So let's say your annual revenue is 500. Well, 500 times 10% is 50K. You've got an owner's draw of 200,000 a year. 25% of that owner's draw is 50K. Again, the, the goal of advertising is to see a correlation between um, more revenue and that owner's draw. So in theory, if you're taking 50K from your owner's draw right now for a budget, you should still get that money back because you've, in theory, made more money. And then keep in mind when you're spending marketing dollars for the right things and for the right reasons, um, it's pretty tax deductible. Obviously, you need to talk to your accountant, um, but a lot of the marketing expenses are, um, you know, can be considered cost of goods sold these days. So let me give you this case example. This is a dream, is, dream scenario for any business. Um, this is a landscaping company, um, started around, um, you know, maybe a little bit earlier than 2020, but 2020 is when they really started going. Kind of small business, you know, think of a guy in a truck, maybe one or two people, about 200K in annual revenue. They were gonna focus on gutter cleaning. You know, gutter cleaning can be very um, profitable if you do it right. So he was looking at efficiencies and other things. He started marketing and uh, decided on a 50K marketing budget, which is kind of that 25% of that owner's draw um, or, you know, kind of 25% of where, where he was trying to get because pretty much that was, um, you know, less expenses. Um, it would have even been a bigger portion of it, but he did lawn signs. Um, he started with a fairly reasonable website, you know, $1,500. Um, a virtual assistant to kind of do some posting and social media. And then he spent 500 for Google reviews, social media, blogs, things like that. And then 2000 on Google ads. And uh, the timing was right. And he was able to really grow that business. And we look at the, that company now for a 2022, he's at about 2.6 million in annual revenue. Um, tree removal has become the new focus. Um, 75K is, is now the new marketing budget, which is only 3%, right? So his marketing budget didn't grow at the same rate as his revenue. Um, lawn signs, uh, the website did get a small upgrade, but not that big of an upgrade. The virtual assistant stayed on, a little bit more revenue spent on the reviews and social, and then a little bit more on Google ads, and then started trying next door ads, right? So this is just an example of how a business um, hopes to see their marketing work. Now, this is really the scenario you'd wanna see going from one, one phase to the next phase. Um, this is one of the biggest questions. Well, what drives the budget? And, and right now I'll say we might be going through, I wouldn't say a recession, but we're, you know, there might be a slowdown in spending. And so if you're finding it that you're, there's a slowdown in the market, um, think about who your end customer is. That's really who drives the market. And you can think about that end customer as your audience. Who buys your product? Um, who's your target market? You know, who are you offering your products to? Who buys from you? And, and really, do they have money, right? If they have budget to spend, and in your mind, they've got money right now, um, then it's a good time to think about that market and that budget, and maybe even going up. If you're consumers don't have a lot of money right now, there's a lot of competition, um, there's not a lot of opportunity for a transaction. Um, some people would say you don't stop advertising, but you certainly need to think about it. And in terms of if you think there's a 
bigger opportunity for you that should drive your budget. So in the case of that landscaping company, he knew there was a big opportunity. He knew he could get from point A to point B. He just needed to get the word out there and beat the competition, so to speak. Okay, so we'll, we can get a little bit more into thinking about that marketing budget, but a lot of it has to do with going back and looking at your research, and then we think about what to prioritize on. So let's talk about that next. What do you actually then spend? And I'm gonna focus a bit more on digital marketing because that's uh, my strong suit. You know, I've certainly done print, I've done TV, I've done radio, but I'm gonna focus more on digital marketing and that's in part because it's um, about 60% of most small business revenue does go into digital marketing. It's becoming a, a bigger and bigger part. I wanna talk about a concept that um, is usually resonates with small business owners and it's the idea of owning versus renting and how that might affect um, your digital marketing budget or some of the things that you're doing. So if you think about Google My Business, everyone's heard of Google My Business. If you haven't gotten a call from an automated service saying your business is not yet updated um then you're in the minority because most of us are getting those calls i get those calls and um think of google my business or google business profile as it's been renamed as a rental property it's like a rental property just like facebook's a rental property yelp's a rental property linkedin and your online listings even your listing on the bbb is kind of like a rental property as long as you furnish it it's a great asset it actually can increase in value you got to add stuff to it but the reason I call it a rental property is because they could take it away. Facebook could change their model. Google business profile could change their model. LinkedIn, all of those things can change or you stop paying your fee and it doesn't get listed. Those are thinking about like rental properties. Uh, your website, your content and your customer database, meaning the actual information you have on your customers that might be in a CRM. This is actually a true asset. This should increase in value over time. And maybe don't think about it as just generates customers, but a true asset that when you go to sell your business, somebody sees that there's real value in that. Um, now, a small business needs an amazing website, kind of like a restaurant needs a menu. And, and I'm biased to a website, but it's kind of like if you have the best food and you can't really understand what it is on the menu, then it's going to be a challenge. And you may not know that it's going to be a challenge until somebody starts to order. And so you actually may not know if your website is strong or not strong until, um, because you're not gonna necessarily get that feedback. There might be hundreds of people going to your website, they're confused, they just call you, they get what they need, big deal. They don't, they're not gonna call you and complain about your website necessarily. But you should be able to evaluate your website on its own. Um, you should definitely think about um, controlling your own URL. So a lot of agencies, we do this for a very small number, but I always tell the customers that we work with, you should really own your URL because that is true value. Owning that URL, um, there are businesses that when a dentist retires, they buy that URL because the dentist sold it to somebody new that didn't want their name on it. And now that new business um, has to start all over again. If they would have actually bought the URL from the pre-existing dentist and slowly transitioned to their new name, they would have immediately had probably at least a 30 or $50,000 asset. Um, so really thinking about that URL is important because it's working out there, whether you know it or not. Um, uh, WordPress is what I think about an owned we website versus a Wix or a Squarespace. That would be like renting because if you're on Wix, you always have to be on Wix. If you're on Squarespace, you always have to be on Squarespace. If you're on WordPress, um, you could actually move it from one hosting company to another because WordPress is actually free. What you're paying for is somebody to build it and host it. But it's kind of like your content. The reason we generally build in WordPress and 41% of the internet is in WordPress is because it is transferable. So if your business were to be sold in a few years um, and it were to be merged into another company, they can actually download all those files and that's what has value. It is also has value if there's traffic and they're creating um, monthly leads and monthly, a monthly presence online, there's value. So Wix, Squarespace, they certainly have value. They certainly help you, but it's more of a rental mentality versus an owned rent mentality. Um, and then content, that will help selling to your audiences. It will help building your site's SEO. It's actually the content that helps with SEO. And if you invest in content, you can use it for brochures, social media, and websites. So I'm always big on investing in content. Um, 
content is also sometimes the most expensive thing to do. Making videos is, a, is fairly expensive. Paying a copywriter is fairly expensive. Um, if you can do your own content and have somebody repurpose it, that's generally the most cost-effective way to manage that content. Are there any questions on this one? Sometimes I get uh, questions, and um, this is often where people want to have a discussion. Is there anyone that wants to talk about this concept? Does it make sense? I had a question for you, Josh. On sure. How much does it cost for that URL? Yeah, buying a URL is, you know, 15 bucks, maybe 25 bucks a year. You do pay that a year, so that should be coming from like, you know, a hosting company. You can go online and you can say buy a URL and you'll go to domain or GoDaddy or something like that. So if you're if you like that, your credit card will get hit like once a year for maybe, you know, 25 bucks. Sometimes you buy like multiple years at once. If you're on GoDaddy, who knows what you're buying because they throw a bunch of other stuff in your shopping cart and sometimes you're not using half the stuff they throw in it, which can be frustrating. But yeah, website or the URL alone, pretty cheap. It, yeah, so it sounds like if it's best to own it, um, it's really not a huge investment. Uh, that should be something everybody should do. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And if you do have an agency that's controlling that URL now, ask if they can transfer it to you. I would absolutely be willing to transfer any URL to, if I'm putting it on my credit card because it's bundled, um, just make sure your credit card's working because <laughs> you don't want that credit card to go up. Here's a kind of a you know, nightmare story, if you will. Um, you know, what not to do with a website. And I'm not gonna necessarily judge this client because they are number one in their market. Um, it is a dentist. Um, they probably do 2.5 million a year. Um, they've been six years with a specialty dental marketing agency. And that agency's done a very good job for them, but in my opinion, it's at a very, um, at a pretty high cost, right? So this particular um, package that they're on is 2,500 a month. So that's $2,500 a month for a WordPress website. Uh, that really, for and that's essentially hosting. And hosting a website um, really should only be about $250 um, a month maximum. That's like some companies that are fairly expensive in the area charge that much. Um, local SEO listings, this is where you're not sure what they're doing. Um, they're definitely not doing $2,000 worth of traditional SEO. Um, if you're just doing local listings SEO, it's going to really, the equivalent value of that today is, you know, $250, give or take. There's lots of services out there for that. Um, they do do analytics and phone coaching. So it's like, how much do you value that? Do you want to have somebody evaluate your front office staff and tell you how they're doing? That could be valuable. For this particular dentist, they don't even use this feature. Um, if you want them to manage your paid advertising, you can. In this case, these guys are not doing it because they weren't happy with the results. And they have a three month out clause, and that's after they've expanded a, a year or more. And the problem with that is that you say, I'm gonna cancel, and three months later, they only give you three days to download your files. And then that means you have to download your files, put them somewhere else, and in three days, um, that's challenging. So I think about that as like kind of a hostage scenario. And unfortunately, a lot of small businesses find themselves in this position when they want to transition their website, because you can do the math on that. That's a lot of money per year just to have a WordPress website up. Um, and on top of this, they do another 3000 a month in uh, Google ads that's paid ads. So if you think about your, if your budget is basically half for your website and half for your Google paid ads, that's probably not the right place to spend your money. They could be doing TV even for that, that amount per month. There's a lot they can do. So there's a company called Burrell & Associates. Um, this is just an idea. Um, advertisers average 5% of gross revenues and spending for their budget and 60% of it goes into digital forms, but typically five different types of media in any given year. So if you think about your overall budget, you could do print, broadcast, search, marketing, um, direct mail, radio, et cetera. And this is a, a great resource for small businesses to think about because they do this huge thing. Now, obviously the reason digital's a big deal now is because you think about how the market's changed, where people are searching for things and then they hopefully find them on Google. And um, I'll just add a plug for our next um, overview about uh, chat GPT because Google's the big thing now, so we're gonna play the Google game, but that could change. Where Google could change um, with chat GPT, um, there are so many different channels and different places to think about it. We're gonna um, just recognize that digital marketing is hard. There's a lot to a lot to think about. 
And so I like to try and simplify it as much as possible and really focus on these areas where you're thinking about your conversion. Does it happen on the phone? Does it happen in your store? Does it happen on a website? And you're thinking about how do customers come back and refer you to other customers or thinking about your reputation, thinking about how easy they can find you online. And you can do a little self-analysis to figure out if they find you, find your services, and then how well you compare. And then the, the last one, which we almost always jump to, is just awareness. That's where you're actually spending money to go out and think about it. So the, the three simple ways to think about prioritizing your digital spend is really, can my customers find me online? So Google yourself, Google your name and your business. Um, Joe Klosterman, electrician. Do you show up? If somebody, if you don't show up, you're in trouble because if somebody knows you, you've got a reputation, they look for you online, they can't find you, that's a problem. And then it's like, can my prospective customers, patients, clients searching um, real estate attorney in Worcester, can they find you? Um, auto parts in Worcester, can they find you? And then if, if they can't find your business based on searching those goods or services, there's, there's something you need to fix. And then the third one is, will they choose me over my competitors? And that's really where you're talking about your reviews. If you're the best company out there, but you've only got four reviews and they're like 4.5 stars because you know there's people that are gonna write bad reviews, it's just how it is. And then there's another company with 500 reviews and they're all 500. They may not be as good of a business as you, but you need to try and get your rep reputation on right, online to reflect that. And then the biggest next one is how do I find new customers? And that's where you're talking radio, print, paid Google ads, paid per click, Facebook videos, all those other things. That's often going out and finding new customers. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna just mention reviews. There's a couple big things on reviews. So in 2021, 81% of consumers said they read Google reviews because that um, is a huge increase because in 2020, it was just 63%. So Google reviews are becoming more and more important. Uh, we talk about millennials. Millennials is, is the largest living generation. So I think all of us are thinking about how to reach more millennials and how to have an impact with our millennial clients. They read reviews when shopping online. So they might be in your store and they might be on reviews. 63% um, of millennials read reviews when shopping in physical store locations. So those reviews is, it's essentially free. You just need to ask people to get reviews. This is an example of like my, my uh, doctor referred a dermatologist. And when I went to that dermatologist, um, you know, they only had 4.1 stars and 50 reviews, which is pretty significant. Um, it means they're organic. And then I looked at the other one and they had 4.9 stars with 700 reviews. Now that's not organic. They're working on it but I actually like that they're working on it. So for me, I'm not a millennial, but it kind of says the, they care about their feedback. They care about their online reputation. So I actually didn't go to the dermatologist my, uh, my uh, primary care recommended. I went to the other one. It also helped that it was a lot easier to schedule an appointment at the other one, which goes to customer service as well. Um, and it's probably why they do a really good job with their reviews because they're thinking about customer service. Um, I'm going to get to the kind of the tail end now is how to track your marketing success. And I do have a free calculator that I'm going to let everyone take a look at and um, and grab. And, you know, thinking about marketing success, th this is a quote by John Wanamaker, which you may have heard. Um, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is I don't know which half. And I think that's something we've we've all asked for. Uh, but in this day and age, I have to say there are really no more excuses because of the digital component to it. So when you think about the cost of doing business or ROI, there are some things that are just the cost of doing business. Um, it's, a, it's almost like saying, should I use email? Well, you don't have to, but it's pretty much how the world works. Um, how about mobile phones? Well, should I have a, uh, that's, that's a crazy thought, of course. You know, you're not gonna think about that as ROI. So the question is, what, what is, um, you know, how do you uh, apply that to digital marketing? Well, should your, um, should your website be really, should you think about ROI for a website? Or should that be the cost of doing business? Should you think about social media as, do you need ROI for social media? Or is that just the type of business? If you know that um, 500 people every day are looking at your Google My Business page, and only you know 10 people are coming into your location, 
yeah, I mean, your Google My Business, Google Business profile and your online presence is very much um, kind of the cost of doing business. So when you really think about ROI, it goes back to these first things that are up on that conversion side, really low funnel, if you think about it. That's kind of the cost of doing business things. But you should absolutely think about ROI for advertising when you're paying money and you fully expect to get customers back from that paid ad, whether it's on Nextdoor or whether it's on Facebook or whether it's on the local TV station. Think about um, this, calc um, you know, it's, the biggest concept is you, you don't wanna let a nickel get in the way of earning a dollar, but you don't wanna go out throwing, throwing around nickels either. Um, so your average customer value is something you should figure out. How much does your average customer spend? And that's something we can, you know, there's a calculator and you can think through that. Uh, digital marketing assets and essentials versus digital advertising and paid leads. And then the ROI, the simple return on investment formula is simply the total value of the customers you earned over that total advertising spend. So for example, if you earned $10,000 from clients, and you spent $5,000 on advertising, you'd have a two times ROI. And um, how do you measure that ROI success? This is actually where it takes work. This is where most small businesses just don't have time. They just don't get to tracking those things which help them measure ROI success. We all want it, but are we willing to keep the spreadsheet? And that's kind of what it's about. You gotta, re um, if you're recording phone calls, most, Google, most companies doing Google ads for you, anything digital, even lawn signs, you can get a phone number that can get recorded phone calls. So you know who's calling you that's an existing client, who's calling you to set an appointment. Those phone calls can be listened to. Um, you can then track maybe your increased online quotes. If somebody's calling you and asking you to show up for a quote, they're scheduling you, those are easier ways to do it. Um, and then you can do just increased requests for directions. That's a little bit harder to do it, but if you have a physical location, Google business profile, will report your re request for directions. And you can kind of use that as one of the ways to track in order to back into um, ROI success. Challenges though, and the, the real thing is you gotta do the work. You have to track actual names and numbers and emails in a spreadsheet. And then you can attribute money to those names. And you can track in a, a customer database or a CRM. Um, HubSpot's free. There's a lot of free CRMs out there for small businesses. Um, they obviously want you to start paying for it, but at a certain point, um, it is free. This is how you might track it. This is just a, a spreadsheet. You've got a, a date. You've got a source. Where'd this come from? Um, first name, last name, email address, and the message. And then you look at it every month. And you chalk it up, and you just look at it. And after you've got enough data, you can actually make all these decisions. And it feels really good to have control of your inflow of leads, even if they don't turn into customers. So this is another exercise. Uh, what is your average sale or deal? Is it $10 a customer, 400, 10,000? And you might just wanna have it in your mind. Okay, if you were to spend $2,000 on paid ads, how many sales do you need? For a lot of my clients, it's only one sale. They only need one big deal. But the problem is if all you do is think about, I just need one big deal and I paid for my advertising. That's kind of, I don't wanna say, um, well, it is, that's kind of a lazy way to do it because then when the market gets tough, you don't have a good handle on your marketing anymore. You're just kind of following the economy. If, if there's a lot of transaction in homes, you're doing really well. If there's a very low transaction in homes, you're doing very poorly. That's not actually tied to your advertising. It's actually just tied to the economy. So if you're not doing the work, it's gonna be harder in a, in a slower market to actually know that you're investing in what you should be investing in. Um, at this point, I want to just take some time for questions because I, I don't think we're going to be able to finish to the next, um, you know, to the next program. Um, this is, I'm happy to do this. If you want to scan that QR code and, and book me, I'm happy to apply some practical things that you can do as a new business startup, growth, established exit plan. Um, but I want to be sensitive um, of everyone's time and I, I am tracking this. But if I did do a good job, and I wouldn't be a good marketer if I didn't ask for this, um, if I did do a good job and if I explained something that was new or unique, um, I'd love to do more of these um, presentations and overviews. So if you want to um, scan that QR code and leave me a review at Google, at Facebook, or at the Better Business Bureau, I'd love to ask for you to do that. I would really appreciate it. 
And with that, I want to open it up to questions and, and send the time back to um, Nancy as well. Okay. So I hope you're all thinking about your questions, but I have one. Um, when you were talking about the website, and how companies can kind of hold your website hostage. Uh, we've seen lots of examples of that here at Better Business Bureau, um, where businesses, um, we have our Better Business Bureau accredited business seal, and they mm -hmm. have difficulty getting that onto their website or when they leave, getting it off. Um, so, what would you recommend um, as far as making sure that a company doesn't hold you hostage and that you're able to um, get the access that you need? Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. I think it starts with when the relationship's good, that's when you should be trying to figure these things out. So if you've got a digital marketing agency and you like them, um, have the conversation. Um, we like you. Um, we appreciate what you're doing for us. If we end our relationship, how do I know that my website is taken care of and that it's it's still mine? Um, how would an out clause, like I always say like use the, my my nephew just came home from college excuse. My nephew just came home from college and he really wants to do our digital marketing. <laughs> and uh, I love those conversations because usually the nephew doesn't last very long. But it's a it's a good way to just kind of throw it out there because obviously most businesses are going to give their nephew a shot or something like that. Um, how would I how would I transition this off of? And then make sure that you have control over your URL. And um, more and more, I think that the trend is to not um, you know be holding those websites hostage, if you will. Um, you know because a lot of what we're doing is you know, digital marketing companies need to make money. And the problem with that is that they, they've been doing things a, a certain way. Um, and that way is just changing. You know, it's a lot easier to do a website than it was five years ago. So if a, an agency is used to doing like year long agreements and you pay $20,000 a year, most of it's not done that way anymore. Most of the time agencies are going to charge you a monthly fee, no obligation. Maybe, uh, maybe your website will pay, a you know, uh, 100 bucks a month and it'll be a year and then after a year it's a 30-day out clause but you know maybe it's a, a three-month requirement on google ads and after a three months it's a 30-day out clause or maybe it's a, a two-month program and then after two months it's a 30-day out clause i would say more and more of the businesses that we're working for are demanding that type of an agreement and uh it's actually i don't want to work with a business who's unhappy with me so i generally um as a professional i just i I want to make sure they're happy, and that's part of our part of our value system. But um, it's it's challenging when we're working with other clients. Of course, one agency might see us as, oh, this company's coming in and taking my business. When the reality, the business owner is coming to me saying, I have a problem with my agency, and I need to do some other things, and I want more control. And most of the time, what I'm hearing from small businesses, they want more control over their digital, and they want to have more transparency into what they can do online. Thank you. Do you have any other questions here? Okay. So, is there a certain percentage of your marketing budget that you should allocate for social media marketing, um, like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, uh, and how do you identify how much you put towards each platform? Good yeah, question. it's a great question. Great question. So there's two ways to think about your social media and marketing budget. There is, is this a rental property or is this paid ads, right? So if it's a rental property, again, social media is free. All you got to do is furnish it. So absolutely, you should have a TikTok page. You should have a LinkedIn page. You should have a presence on Yelp. All of those things are free. Um, let's take TikTok. Um, if you're the type of person that likes to make videos and you can actually make videos of your business, um, you can get some views pretty quickly on TikTok right now. Um, not a lot of great ROI, but it's kind of like a stake in the, in the ground. You want to get your TikTok name. You want to get your Facebook page. You want to get your even Twitter out there. 
even if you're not making any money on it. So what do you invest in? You invest in the creation of it and you invest in the content that goes there. Now the content is gonna be the most expensive thing or hiring somebody to do it. Um, if you can produce your own content, great. If you can get your company, um, salespeople to send you a before and after photo of everything you do and you can get them to take photos, that's great. I would say you can be more casual online and the more personal you get, the better. The less personal you get, um, the harder it is to grow. And I'm I'm not necessarily a transparency personal sharer online. My personal social is one place, my business social is another. But that doesn't change the fact that people that mix business and personal do much better social when we're talking organic. The next concept of that is let's use Nextdoor. Um, Nextdoor, we run ads as an agency of Nextdoor. You can go on to Nextdoor and create your presence and you can then um, pay Nextdoor, right? And so it's, it's one to have a presence, it's another to pay them. Facebook, same thing. You can pay Facebook. Um, TikTok, you can pay TikTok. However, most of the companies making money on TikTok are gonna be consumer packaged goods selling across the country. Um, so the paid ads, you know, you can start doing paid ads on Facebook for, you know, depending on the size of your business, you can test like $200 or $300. As far as having somebody maintain these sites, um, what I would say is, you know, you might, you could pay, um, we do it, we do basically all social, all reviews management, everything, um, either on a platform so that you can manage all in one place and don't have to log into 15 different sites, or you can hire um, one of our interns or one of our digital marketing assistants that then goes and does it for you. And generally you're in the $500 a month range, which is about the average cost of an intern. So we kind of provide that, but you can um, think about those two worlds to pay someone to do it, um, that costs money. To do it yourself, it's free, but you gotta be doing it. And maybe if you charge $200 an hour to do what you do, you're actually paying somebody in marketing $200 an hour to do it then. And then of course, the paid ads. And the paid ads would be when you actually say, I'm gonna boost a post, I'm gonna pay for something. And then that's when you um, are thinking about it. So. Let's say your Google budget is a thousand dollars a month. Um, your paid ads budget, um, if you're doing that, I would I would hope that your social is already in order by the time you start giving Google a thousand dollars a month. And um, when you start paying Facebook for media, I'd say maybe your Google budget is a thousand a month. Just as an example, your Facebook ads account might be, and including Instagram because Facebook owns Instagram, that might be five hundred a month, half of that Google budget. Biggest difference is if somebody's searching for your products, chances are they'll find you on Google. If somebody's trying to discover your products or you, they don't know that you even exist, maybe you've got a really unique product, maybe you clean like you know, windows and that's not something people normally think of doing um, for your house, you might need to tell people about it. So you might need to create discovery and that's where you're thinking more Facebook, Instagram. Hopefully that answers. That's a great answer. <laughs> um, so that gives me a, another question. Uh, should the content of the, the ads that you're putting on social, should they vary depending upon which medium you're using? Like, should you have a different point of view for LinkedIn than you have for Facebook? Yeah, that's a good question. So in an ideal world, yes, it should be customized every time um, for every platform but I would say very few small businesses have the time to do the bare minimum, let alone do it at an advanced level, right? So I think at a bare minimum, the way I encourage my small businesses to think about it is, is be keyword based. And in our, um, when we share tools, this is gonna be one of the tools that I'll share is think about your five keywords for your business and think about your location. The keywords you always wanna say, you wanna pepper those into any conversation that you're having. Um, and your location becomes very important too. So, oh, I'm Josh, we do WordPress websites, we do um, social media management, and we help you grow your Google reviews. And um, we work for businesses based in, in greater Massachusetts or you know Massachusetts and um, maybe New England at that. But I might even just say Harvard, I might even just say Worcester. I might use, even use the name of my town because that's gonna be better. Um, and if you can then, uh, put an image on there, uh, 
Instagram is going to be better for images. So Instagram is much more image heavy, less um, SEO keyword related. But those keywords are going to be hashtags. The visual, meaning the image, could be a, a photo that you take with your own phone, which will include the geo stamp, that location stamp. If you get photos that are stock photos, they're not going to have the geo stamp that says you're in your area and you're actually a local business. So phone, phone photos actually work really well. Um, professional photos don't necessarily work as well because you might have a photographer in Acton, Massachusetts, and you know you're in um, you know Worcester. So it's it's different uh, in terms of the videos. Videos are actually the best way to do it. If you can get a video every time, then that's great. A lot of us are nervous about being on video all the time, and a lot of us are like, "That's dumb. Why would I video that?" But a video might be, "Here's my lawnmower. It's an awesome machine." That's a video. A video might be, here's my truck. This is a, a, my logo. It's a great truck. It might be, here's a view of this house before I painted it. Here's a view of this house after I painted it. These are things that if they could be built into your content creation, um, it's great. In terms of, does it go on to Google Business Profile and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn and all those things? I would say yes, unless you're actually putting on all of those and you're doing more for just Instagram, you're doing contests, for example, and you're doing more for LinkedIn, you're doing B2B pitches, and you're doing more for Twitter, you're doing shorter form things that are gonna get you PR or picked up. Most of the time, you're not doing that secondary thing that makes that valuable. So TikTok, maybe I'm targeting a younger demo. Most of us don't have time to do the bare minimum, which is five keywords, as many social as you can, and your location. That's kind of the bare minimum. Five keywords, as many social as you can, and um, you know, making sure that you can kind of actually just get 10 or 20 posts out a month. That's probably the phase one of social. Thank you. All right. Does it look like we have any other questions? Um, great, great questions. Really appreciate it, Nancy. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's uh, really been great having you. This is uh, very valuable information. And um, I'm sure when people have time to think about it, they'll have more questions. <laughs> so reach um, back out. I'm available all the time. So all right, all right. Well, that's great. So uh, as I did mention, I'll be sending out the um, presentation uh, and recording to all those in attendance. So you have that uh, because it went. It was so great. I, I, I couldn't take notes, so I'm glad you shared the presentation with us. And uh, we have another presentation uh, scheduled for um, March 2nd. Um, and that's our next Business Builders webinar. And uh, so it'll be uh, great if you folks would come back for that and, and tell your friends. Uh, same time, Thursday at noon. All right. Thank you, everybody and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much.